Ray developed the first ever U.S. EPA biosafety <coughs> research program for GMOs, and he was responsible for environmental monitoring of the first ever environmental release of GMO bacteria. He has given numerous scientific GMO presentations in North America, Central America, and Europe on various aspects of GMO biosafety considerations. And on top of all that, he has authored over 150 peer-reviewed science articles plus co-authored three books. He's a very busy man, and now he's doing lots of presentations around the valley. Um, and also, Chris Harding will be on the program. Um, I'm not sure how y'all are going in order, but I think most everybody in this room actually knows Chris. I uh, probably don't really need to introduce him, but he is our most favorite farmer and seed grower in the valley. <laughs> Thank you so much for turning out tonight. Hey, it's Friday night, and I'm sorry, I guess none of us have a life. Uh, tonight, uh, you are my experiment. I have put uh, two or three new things, radically different new things, in the presentation. You, you mean like experiment ray, as in lab rat? <laughs> yes, I, I do. So I take a little time to talk about that. <laughs> and either you might be interested in it or you'll say, nah. So let me give some feedback later. Okay. So a couple of parts are, are really different. And I want to uh, publicly thank uh, one of you all, uh, Kevin. Uh, a few weeks back, he said something like, Ray, do you know about the frog deal? or something like that, and I said, well, what do you mean? So I have a little piece uh, about frogs, thanks to Kevin, and uh, appreciate your bringing that up. Yeah, it's a lot going on there. So about three weeks ago, uh, I came across an editorial in the New York Times, and it was very unusual, and it really grabbed me and really influenced me. It was written by another scientist, not a politician, but a scientist. And his message was to other scientists. And the bottom line and the top line, the name of this article was, if you see something, say something. Talking to other scientists. And he went on to say in his editorial that, in his estimation, that scientists have an obligation to the public. If something is going on in their area of expertise and you see something, say something. So that's what I'm all about tonight. I'm going to say something. And I'm going to try to be telling you just what I see about the science. And I will start out by telling you that I've spent about 25 years or so either working or following on after I retired about what's going on in this industry. And I was asked a little while ago, did I, was I ever influenced to, let's say, to be uh, more neutral or less concerned? And I said, no, never. But what has happened in the last seven to ten years, my interest and my concerns have come up because of scientific manifestations of what's going on. And that is the topic that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. These are the topics that I'm going to try to get through tonight. Don't worry for two reasons. Some of them only have one or two or three slides <laughs> uh, attached to them. And I'm going to give you a really, I hope, really good series of short take-home lessons when we get all the way through this. So you remember what's important in terms of what I try to present to you. So, as it says, what are the promises, what are the processes, and the products regarding genetically engineered organisms? And one of my new topics that's come up, uh, because it's been so relevant and in the news, what are the rules of labeling and why are consumers confused? Dollar costs associated with genetically engineered crops, whether we're for them or against them, we're all paying for it, dollar-wise. Oh, and ecologically speaking, we're all paying for it, and possibly in other ways. And then a lot of my presentation will then go into all about Roundup. Let's talk Roundup tonight. Why should you and I, as citizens of Jackson County, be concerned about Roundup-resistant weeds? 
Uh, is this a period that we're seeing right now, the front end of the bye-bye roundup? What's coming next, if it is? There's a concern. And from the heart, all living things are connected. And I want to share with you some of the untold, if you will, unpublicized ramifications of the management issues and the what the toxins do to other critters uh, amongst us that live out in nature. And then I'll finish with talking a little bit about yields, or lack thereof. Go back to the 80s and think about all the promises. Promises from the technology to our nation's farmers, through the work to the world's farmers, increased yields. And over 50% of the farmers said, I bought into the technology because of that. Increased yields. Increased use of pesticides. Convenience, a big deal. Convenience of my farming practices, so what's not the like? The process of making these critters, uh, I'm going to get loud and passionate here and tell you that it involves only a few genes to be merged with very different organisms that create unique, novel, first-of-a-kind, patentable products that one do not occur naturally and do not occur ever, 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 ever through traditional crossbreeding. Because, what did I tell you? A few genes from highly unrelated organisms. So how can that be natural? It is not part of the natural reproductive processes. And basically, folks, anything that you buy in the supermarket that's called food, if it's not organic, it's likely to have a genetically engineered derived product in it, directly or indirectly. If it's canola oil, you may not see or feel or know or that there are genetically engineered genes or gene products that's been purified out. But if you buy canola oil, you are supporting the technology and the industry. Okay? So how is all of this stuff accomplished? How, do you, how does one go about making a genetically engineered plant? Okay, so let's say, like years ago, we wanted to make a tomato that was frost resistant. We wanted to put a unique piece of genetic material into that tomato derived from a fish that lives and thrives in water below freezing. And there is a gene that makes a protein that does something to the water molecule that prevents it from freezing to about 29 to 30 degrees. How do we get that into that tomato to protect it? It's not through a fish gun. <laughs> it's through a gun, but it's called a gene gun. And if we wanted to make a plant resistant to glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in the commercial product called Roundup. And forgive me, I'll probably say glyphosate half the time and Roundup half the time. It's all the same thing to me in, in my head. So if we want to make a plant resistant to glyphosate, we take some genetic material from a given bacterium, isolate it, purify it, mix it with some bullets, and those bullets are microscopic sized particles of gold or tungsten, and then literally through compressed air blow it into a plant cell, literally. Diagrammatically, this is what I'm talking about. We take either a chunk of plant or individual cells. Here are the DNA molecules, the circles, derived from a bacterium. We put it into a so-called particle gun or gene gun and blow it, blast these bullets into plant tissue. And this is what it might look like diagrammatically. This is the center part of a one plant cell we call the nucleus, where the chromosomes reside. Here's the bullet piece of microscopic size of gold. The DNA from the bacteria has come off of that particle because it's now inside the nucleus of the cell. And these little red particles, which may be further <coughs> gene to glyphosate resistance, are going to be hopping into one or more of the chromosomes. <coughs> and I hope I have time because I'm going to give you a little story, the analogy here. These genes say, in this case, glyphosate resistance, will hop in randomly, more or less, 
into any one or more chromosomes in random positions. Okay? Think about Thanksgiving dinner and a three-generational family is sitting down at the table just about to partake in the feast. There's the grandma and grandpa sitting at the head of the table and the family is around and they're just about ready to start. Opens up the front door and about five strangers walk in and they say, good evening, we're joining you for dinner. And they sit down randomly at that table. That's kind of, in my mind, my analogy here to when the genes get exploded into the nucleus of a plant cell. You have some visitors. And one of these visitors, say, might sit down between the older gentleman and his wife. And the wife says, Hi, honey. You gonna sit here all night with me? And the, the old man might be thinking, Who the heck is that? What is that? What's going on here? And another stranger may sit down in an empty chair, say, between the pregnant lady and her husband, and neither one of them want anything to do with that stranger. And maybe there is a young lady who is single, sitting in another place, and another stranger may sit down next to her. What I'm trying to say is that DNA comes in and carries a message, and it will randomly hit the chromosome, and will cause any and all or none different kinds of following consequences. It can cause mutations because it may have separated two loving genes. It may have started a new relationship with another gene that never existed previously. It's a bacterial gene in a plant cell. And all the different kinds of combinations that you can imagine. So what's done to minimize these wild things? Are you still with me? Yeah. <laughs> Well, of course the technicians and the scientists that work for the, the seed industry are going to be screening for untold and undesirable characteristics. What kind of characteristics do they screen for? Yield, uh, suitability to growing in a specific environment, say Central Oregon versus Southern Oregon, disease resistance, and those kinds of characteristics that have economic significance. Do you think they're going to look for unusual, unexpected toxins that may have been produced? Count on it. No. They're not required to. Etc. 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 So it's not exactly a crapshoot, but it's not thoroughly investigated each time one is made. As long as the agronomic properties of the genetically engineered plant are suitable for its commercial use, it will go forward. Please, just touch the pad. So let me change the subject here with you now that you know a little bit about how this stuff is made. And let's talk labeling. A lot of consumer uh, confusion about this. In 1992, the U.S. Congress gave authority to the, Fed, uh, to the Food and Drug Administration through the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to label foods, to see that industry labels our foods. 1992. And we have two products. One is labeled, and do we need to put a new label on something else? And how is that determined? Well, the new label comes if something is significantly different in a material way. Material way means we can detect a difference with our senses. We see a difference, or we taste a difference, the texture is different, and so on. And for genetically engineered corn versus non-GE corn, none of those apply. But, let me give you an example of how this does work. With non-genetically engineered, farm-raised Atlantic salmon. Uh, this is naturally uh, uh, caught out from the ocean Atlantic salmon. It's non-genetically engineered, does not have any artificial compounds added like this astaxanthin. This is the same fish and the coloring has been added to the food to darken the appearance of the flesh. You see a difference between this and this. So when you go to your box store and you buy farm-raised Atlantic salmon, right on the price tag it will say something like color added through food 
or a color added. That's the label. You sense a difference. You see a difference. Okay. Non-genetically engineered. Now we're told there is a new product that might be approved called the Arctic Apple. In the Arctic Apple, there is a technology called gene silencing, which tempers down, turns down, turns off the activity of a natural process inside an apple. And that natural process is called the browning reaction. We probably all know this. So if you bruise an apple, you cut an apple, and you expose it to the air, an enzyme is expressed, and the apple begins to turn brown, like here. <coughs> where the genetically engineered arctic apple stays more or less white. So I am wondering, I am confused, there is a color difference here. This is genetically engineered, this is not, and there's no label that's going to be applied that says this apple is genetically engineered. But we apply that practice, we do give the label in the non-genetically engineered fish. Why is that? I don't really know the answer. And it's confusing to me. Because who's in charge of FDA? Okay. I can't say that. <laughs> so if you go to the grocery store and you see these beautiful sliced apples, this is what you might see. And you're going to say, oh my god, that's old. I'm going to reject that. And you're going to want to buy the nice white sliced apples, right? That, I'm afraid, might have something to do with the labeling issue here. Uh, okay, there are 64, at least 64 countries in the world that label their foods. Here's the next confusing item. We export a lot of food, as you all know, especially grains, from this country around the world. China, Russia, Western Europe. And if that food, for example, is genetically engineered soy or corn, coming from Midwest farms, those consumers in these countries, when it arrives, we'll see on the label contains food genetically engineered, <coughs> food genetically engineered derived, or a statement like that. But us consumers here who might receive the same product from the same state, and theoretically, I don't know as a fact, but theoretically <coughs> from the same farm, will not have a chance to see that label. You've got to go to China to see it. <laughs> Confused? I'm confused. Why? What? Is there a difference between the red nations and the white? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> good question. The short answer is no. <laughs> uh, but I did forget to tell you that it isn't always the entire country that labels. It may be the equivalent of states, like in the United States. European nations have states, and they also have counties, the equivalent counties. So sometimes it's a few counties, sometimes it's a state, sometimes it's the whole country. Okay, moving on, I think I already said you should already know ahead of time that these products are unique so they're patentable. That's the American way. I don't have any problem with the concept of patenting these products. But patenting food uh, has some kinds of social, economic feelings of uneasiness in my way of thinking. And it has a real world potential to impact the prices. And what is my proof for that? So we're going to look at two slides that deal with the concept of CPI index, Consumer Price Index. And all that is, is a comparison of how much something cost you last year and how much something cost you, the same stuff cost you this year, or 10 years ago and today, or 15 years ago and today, and so on. And there is a consumer price index for virtually everything that you can ever buy in the United States. Energy products, food products, clothes, you name it, there is a CPI index. So if you have that concept, let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the farmers and ask them how much they've been paying for their seeds. During this 15 year period, 95 to 2011, the overall 
consumer price index for everything we buy on average in the United States increased 45 percent. That means if something costs $25 in 95, 1995, it would cost about $36 in 2011. <coughs> 25 to 36. What about genetically engineered seeds? It's not up 45 percent, it's up 259 percent to the farmer. So what back way back then in 95 they cost 25 bucks and now cost them 87.50 the same thing is seen with soybean seed not 45 percent cpi but 325 percent similarly cotton seed through the roof the cost of the seeds the best that i can estimate and you know it'll be a function of crop yield soil type whether you've got uh, uh, irrigation, how you manage your crop. But, so in general, the costs to the farmers, they're in the magnitude of 10% of their gross receipts, about 10%. On top of this, because we have patented material that needs to be protected, and an industry has a major financial investment in it, I understand from what I read of the order of $40 million dollars per single product, a lot of money. Here's a technology fee that farmers pay. <coughs> Besides the contract that they have to sign, which says you can't give any of your seeds away, you can't save any of your seeds, this is how you're going to manage your crop, these are the herbicides, these are the pesticides, and this is how you're going to fertilize, a whole list of instructions. There is the technology fee. So for corn, about 60 bucks an acre, soybean a little less, and cotton again through the roof. Since there are so many millions and millions and millions of acres of these crops, a little bit of cost per acre kind of adds up in a hurry. To the tune of about almost nine billion, with a B, dollars. Whoa! <laughs> nine billion just for the technology. So you may wonder, Seeds are going up like crazy. Doubled the last six years, tripled in the last ten. Do you think the farm, it's fair to our farmers to absorb all of those increased costs and not pass it on to the next party? Do you, do you interject questions or is that too interesting? Oh, uh, sure. Give it a try. Cactus are only good for 21 years. What is that going to mean to all this? They're only, you, you have to, uh, they're only good for 21 years. It isn't going to matter because within that time frame, there will probably be at least two or more generations of new products with new patents to take the place of the old one before the old patent is gone. But then those old patents are a free-for-all, aren't they? Pardon me? Aren't they a free-for-all then? Anybody can use the old patent and grab it. Unless you have enough money to buy out Johnson Seeds, who in 10 years wants to grow genetically engineered corn, I'm going to buy you out. So even, you know, we don't have any patent, but you're going to, you're going to sell that? I, I want a piece of the action. And guess who has a lot of money to do that? Okay, the seed companies. We don't need to mention them by name. Very large cash flow companies. Let's look at the CPI on only foods was 45% on everything, but, you know, we all go shopping, buy foods. We know that foods always go up. Wow. Indeed, 130% just for our foods in a similar time range. So, in terms of what our farmers are seeing with their genetically engineered crops, do you think they're getting more money to cover their costs? Yes, they are. For example, genetically engineered corn has gone up 287%. That's the value based, not where you and I go to the store to buy corn, but what the farmer receives are. Okay. Genetically engineered soybean, over 200%. As contrasted to non-genetically engineered wheat, 140%. How about oil? Genetically engineered wheat. Canola, 
230. Soy oil, over 200. Non-genetically engineered peanut oil, down 140%. Non-GE olive oil, 60%. Now don't get confused. This is nothing, this is not saying that olive oil is cheap. It's just telling you that's how much the price changed in this 12-year period. So there's a lot of new money going in the world and a lot of competition for food. For example, last year we ran out of soy and we had to import some. So it's big money companies. We're talking many billions of dollars of industry. In fact, you know how many acres there are planted in the, in the world to genetically engineer crops? You know that it's about the equivalent of six land masses of the state of Oregon. A big industry. So I think we're all paying a little bit of a price premium, I'm claiming, for this genetically engineered food that a lot of companies and a lot of farmers have been sold on, have been given a sell job, in my estimation, for promises of convenience, yield, and more money. <coughs> So let's talk Roundup. Let's talk glyphosate. When I was a student and we would be shown a picture like this or actually experiencing this, we would know that it was insecticide that was being sprayed. Today it's herbicide that is being sprayed. Glyphosate and relatives thereof. A tremendous amount. You don't have a feeling for the number. I don't have a feeling for the meaning of the number. For example, it's 90,000 tons. A farmer being recently quoted, an Iowa farmer, geez, you know, when biotech came onto the market, we only had one airplane to do all the spraying. Now we've got seven or eight. We've got the same number of acres. Holy mackerel. Does that mean seven to eight times? Only in his county. You know what happened? It's more like 10 or 11 times. Okay, 90,000 tons of glyphosate is applied to U.S. soils every year. What does that mean? Okay, one ton, yeah, 2,000 pounds, I think I should know. Two ton, yeah, the weight of my car, a truck, pickup truck. 1,000 tons? What is that? 90,000 tons? What is that? So here's my little attempt to help us out. You see that ship? Queen Mary II. It weighs 76,000 tons. So think about the mass equivalent of Roundup or glyphosate, which is 90,000 tons. So if we include all these buses and all of these cars, we'd still have like 76,100. We don't even get close to the glyphosate. One chemical just in the United States. Argentina uses the equivalent of three Queen Mary ships worth of glyphosate on one third of the acres. A little bit less regulatory oversight there. So they use about nine times more than what we do. Why do we care? I think I told you five minutes ago, we imported soy last year into this country. Where do you think we imported it from? Do I need to answer that question? Why is so much Roundup used? In the Midwest agricultural press, it's called the farmer's heroine or agricultural heroin, because so many of our farmers are hooked on it for convenience. Mm -hmm. There's a question back here that's important. Oops, what does sorry. it have to do with What that? does Roundup have to do with genetically engineered products? Okay. I am so lost in this, in this talk that I can't see straight. It's okay. Crazy. I know what Roundup is. Okay. Uh, earlier on, I gave you an example of how a genetically engineered yes. plant is made using resistance to glyphosate. That's how they relate. 
virtually all of the corn, 90% on another slide, virtually all of the soy, about 90-93%, uh, cotton, way up there, percent, are made to resist an herbicide, glyphosate. So that the farmers can control weeds, which negatively impact the yield of their crops. Is that okay? So you're saying the the guys you want won't get killed off by the by the uh, Roundup, but the weeds will. The, is our, that what you're saying? Our food, mm -hmm. our spray is spray, <laughs> and I'll, I've got some slides to a little bit ahead of me, but let me answer the question. All of these crops are sprayed directly, as the two airplanes showed, with glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And all the weeds that are in the way in that field get taken out. Right. For a while. But doesn't Roundup take out everything that's green? Yeah. Yes. Except, except, if, it's except if it's resistant. Except if it's resistant. Yeah. Yes, and we're about to get taken out. Please well, that's why most big farmers don't use Roundup. <laughs> Honestly, they do not. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, too, but you're wrong. <laughs> uh, okay. Any other questions? Uh, 90,000 tons is not... No farmers are using it. Yeah. And they use it because they can, so it won't kill their crop. They use it right here. I'm on it because they paid for it. If you have a cell phone and you pay for a thousand minutes a month, you sit on that phone, no, you use it. The farmers are paying a premium for seeds, they're paying a technology fee, and then, by God, why not? They're going to use that technology. So they're hooked on it. It's the agricultural peril. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought also it like makes some resistance just like doctors over prescribe antibiotics. I've got about five slides to go to get to that. And so it does the same thing with weeds. I agree fully. Right on. Yes. True. One farmer said, well, I already told you. I paid for it, so I'm going to use it. Uh, it's agricultural heroin. And if you use it year after year after year after year, guess what happens? You get resistant weeds. Okay. Here's an example. This is a soybean field in Illinois. Early on, little plantlets here are soy. It's been sprayed, everything to kill everything. But the soy won't die because it's resistant, right? It's, re it's got the bacterial gene that confers resistance to glyphosate. So everything is sprayed because the farmer can, that's why they buy the technology, and the weeds are killed off. Well, it used to work like that. But occasionally a resistant weed will pop up, like right here, and your crop is only now resistant to glyphosate. So, what happens? This happens. Where's the crop? This happens in a cornfield. You see the 14-foot high weeds back here? Where's the corn? How does this happen? How does this work? Why do we have an explosion of resistant weeds? It's through a process called natural selection. The resistant weed is always there, somewhere out in the world. And it's crowded out by all the other weeds around it. But if you remove all of the other weeds around it by spraying, you're only going to be left with the ones that are resistant, right? That's a naturally occurring, infrequent event called a mutation. And you never see it if you're going to plow the field under. You see, get rid of everything. But if you're going to spray it, you are really going to find those resistant weeds will just, hi, here I am. And if, you farm, if the farmer misses it and it goes to seed and makes 10,000 seeds off of one plant, my God, what has he got next year? No he won't know until he's got the crop planted. The crop comes up. Hey, it's weed control time, and I'm going to spray again. And what happens? Resistance. How do you fix that? Well, one farmer says, my God, we're back to where we were 20 years ago. I'm trying to find out what works to get rid of these weeds. Another one says, 
Well, finding out what works is going to cost us all more money, isn't it? You and I are both included. And the president of the Arkansas Association of Conservation Districts said, my God, this is the single largest threat to American agriculture that I have seen, weed resistance. It doesn't happen overnight. Here's what's happened in the U.S. kind of phasing in over about 10 years. So the colored states are the states that are having problems with weed resistance. And of course, those states are the major farming states of the nation, of course. So California is kind of hanging out here in 2002. They had a weed resistance problem. Lo and behold, here comes Oregon in four, and so on. And by 2010, California color changed a lot, and they had at least four documented problems. Today, they have more than five. This is 2014. Cotton Belt has been inundated. Total bottom line, over 60 million acres in the United States contain glyphosate-resistant weeds that are affecting the yields of the crops. What do we do? It's like the antibiotic resistance situation. You have an infection, you go to the doctor, you buy an antibiotic, and you hope that you get better. If you have the equivalent of the resistant weed, if you have a resistant germ, you'll go back in another week and say, Doc, I'm still not feeling well. No problem, here's another antibiotic. Oh, I'm sorry, it's going to cost you a little more. And maybe you got some side effects coming, but you'll be all right. Doc, it's three weeks and I still have my infection. I, I must have one of those multiply antibiotic resistant germs. No, you have weeds that maybe are resistant to five, six, seven classes of herbicides. Doc, what am I going to do? You go to the hospital. We have to give you an IV, and we hope this time it works. <clears throat> so the equivalent of this is in the seed industry, you start bringing in other chemicals, right? These are analogous to the other antibiotics. And those other chemicals may have more severe environmental effects. They may cost the farmer a little bit more. The farmer may have to go to a mini course in college, put on by extension office to learn how to use these other herbicides because they're so toxic. Some of them are probable carcinogens and you don't want to get it mixed in in the food supply, etc. And that's where we are today with this technology. I know these names may not mean anything to you yet, but I suspect they will in the future years. These are some of the new chemicals that the seed industry is bringing on by making your corn, making your soy, making your cotton resistant to these new chemicals like they were resistant crops to glyphosate. So are, are you with me? So we not only have glyphosate resistance, we have resistant crops to 5 sulfuron, which kills bugs in our streams and lakes, <coughs> And the days olanones, somewhat like glyphosate, 2,4-D, dicamba, and this isoxaflutol. You never heard of isoxaflutol, probably, so let me tell you a little story. EPA says it's a probable carcinogen, and there's all kinds of research to that effect in the literature. Three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, three farming states say, you know, that stuff gets into our water supply, our groundwater. It's a probable carcinogen. We really don't want it in this state. And the farmers say, come on, we need it. Okay, you can use a little bit of it, but here are the special rules. But in the last couple of months, we found out that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has now approved, without restrictions, soybeans that are resistant to glyphosate, 
isoxafutol, and something called mesotriol, three different herbicides that can be used wherever this soybean is planted in the United States. And it's on tens of millions of acres in many Midwestern states. Is that confusing? It is to me. I don't know how, well, the USDA's issue is they cannot regulate uh, on the basis of resistance to herbicides. They don't have any rules that say you can't, not, you can't let this one out, you can't let this one out. So the rules have to be modified, but I don't, I don't see that. Does yes. that mean that three genes have been put in? Exactly right. Okay. And then right on. Use, right. use three herbicides. Uh, yes. And remember, it's all to combat the weed resistance problem. So we use another chemical with or without glyphosate, they're recommending. So if you have a field that's still responding to glyphosate, they're saying you can't use it, but maybe you should use two. So you don't get a weed resistance problem. <laughs> okay, quickly. I want to tell you a little bit, just changing the pace entirely here, about how all living things are interconnected, and there is a problem. I don't read about it in the newspapers. I think it was missed, because it's kind of coming in the back door with a problem with Mother Nature involving the over-application of glyphosate. And I want to share that with you. I'm going to ask you some questions. You tell me what it is you think I'm going to talk about. What is the organism that I'm going to talk about? Insects. When we lose an entire species, as scientists said, it affects another and another and another because of our circle of life. Bees. 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 What was that? That's it. Monarch butterflies. A child said they deserve to live. They're part of nature. I said we've lost 80% of them in the last 17 years. And a mother said, well, they inspire us because they somehow can survive and navigate a 3,500-mile journey into the mountains of Mexico for the winter. There it is. <laughs> Just recently, last month, the World uh, Wildlife uh, uh, Fund in Mexico mm -hmm. published this relationship. And let's go over this. It's crucial that I want you really to understand this. Here we have the total area occupied by these monarch butterflies when they go to migrate to Mexico and they settle in for the winter. How many acres of forest do they occupy? And the other way we have the years. And you see here in the uh, early to mid-90s, uh, about eight units of the forest are occupied. Then it goes to 12 and then to 20. So they're increasing dramatically in numbers. And then they fall off. Now the year-to-year -year actual measurements are up and down, up and down, up and down, due primarily to weather considerations, both here and in Mexico. So scientists have drawn the straight line, which mathematically takes into consideration all of this fluctuation. It's kind of an average line. And I ask you, do you know what happened between this high point and this point here? Would you like to venture a guess? Right there. What happened? They introduced the roundup. There it is. Right on. Genetically engineered plan. <laughs> Glyphosate resistance was introduced. Okay. So does that mean that the plants themselves are killing the butterflies? Or is it something associated with the management? We don't know yet from what I just told you. So look at this map here of the United States. This is the breeding zone where 95% of the butterflies breed. Goes up a little bit into Canada, comes down into the south, but maybe pretty much ignores uh, the cotton belt. So we're talking corn and soybeans. Mm -hmm. What do we think about this part of our country? What goes on there? What goes on in this part of our country? Corn and soybeans. 
that happens to be where the dominant major problem is with glyphosate resistant weeds. So are the glyphosate resistant weeds killing off the butterflies? Or is it something that caused the weeds to come? We don't know yet. Okay, I'm going to tell you, as you, you can see, this is a soybean field, and it's been sprayed with Roundup, and the weeds are starting to go. This right here is the milkweed. One of the other incredible properties of this butterfly, it only eats one thing, one plant, one plant, and it's called the milkweed. That's all it eats. Doesn't eat corn, doesn't eat soy, doesn't eat anything else. Yeah, it pollinates, but it only eats one plant, and that's the milkweed. Why? It, again, it's called evolution. Anybody in here ever <coughs> seen a milkweed, ever pop it open, you know what it's inside? Well, it's milky substance, and it's sticky, and it's full of toxic garbage that the larvae eat to protect themselves over time so that birds don't go after the larvae. The birds learn, oh, that's a bitter little caterpillar over there. I'm not going to eat it. So that's why the monarchs, monarchs evolved into eating milkweed. And that's all they eat. Okay, eight days later, this is what the field looks like. And wow, you see, agricultural heroin at work. How convenient it is to fly over this field and blast all the weeds and not touch my crop. What else is going on here? What else do you see? Where's the milkweed? Okay. Here's the milkweed right here. Where's my food? I've just been gassed with glyphosate. Where's my food? The reason why I turn off the light, parenthetically, let me just say, if you look closely, you can see something green here. You can see something, uh, I think a stalk of grass right here. You can see something green right there. Guess what those are? Resistance. Those are Roundup resistant weeds coming. This is about a square foot of field. He's going to be in trouble in a year, this farm, he or she. Back to the monarch. This is the change in the density of its only food, starting in 1999, a drop-off. Another study, a drop-off in agricultural fields, so that now we're down to less than 20% of the food. Okay, so starting from the introduction of genetically engineered organisms to 2005, there was about a 45% decline in the monarch populations. Thereafter, on top of that 45%, there was another 75% decline. Okay, here's the red line, the introduction of genetically engineered crops. Bang, it drops down. Right here in 2005 is the introduction of the Unique Farm Bill that encourages our farmers to plant corn for ethanol production. Mm -hmm. So between here and here, we have about 60 million acres of crops where the management uses Roundup. 60 million acres. But from here <coughs> to present day, we added another 100 million on top of the 60. And received, in parallel, another crash in the population of the butterflies. Saying it in another way, during those time periods, we went from about 10,000 tons of glyphosate to about 50,000 in about a nine-year period. Then in a shorter period of time, we dumped out another 40,000 tons of glyphosate on an annual basis. So now we're up to that 90,000 ton figure that I mentioned to you before. And to me, this is the bottom line right here. When you have 50% loss of the food, you have 50% reduction in egg production. When you have 80% elimination of the food, you have an 80% reduction in the butterfly egg. Pretty good kind of a causation here. Mm -hmm. 
So in a couple of years, are we going to see the lone butterfly in our agricultural GE corn? Or are we going to see a thriving population come back in Mexico? Which way are we headed? The authors said, we have not yet seen the full impact of this. The food for monarchs in the Midwest will be permanently reduced unless we change something soon. And those scientists were at two Midwestern universities. We can talk about frogs quickly. All living things in Frogs are eaten by some beautiful creatures. Frogs eat things like bugs, annoying bugs. Bet you didn't know. Frogs produce some remarkable chemicals, excreting them through their skin. So we want to keep these guys around because kind of the canary in the mine, they're very sensitive to environmental perturbations, to environmental toxins. This warded guy, for example, makes a chemical excreted through the skin that controls blood pressure in human beings. This blue guy makes a chemical that can block the transmission of HIV. This funny looking waxy yellow guy produces a new antibiotic that is active against antibiotic resistant bacteria. Truly important find. This red toad called a poison frog, well why is he poison? He makes a chemical that is really a painkiller, 200 times more potent than morphine. Don't tell me there are any cancer survivors that wouldn't enjoy such a potent painkiller. African frog produces a chemical through its skin that cures foot ulcers in diabetics. And this guy produces a hormone that cures peptic ulcers, but unfortunately, he's <coughs> now extinct. No more health there. Here's some examples of how sensitive frogs are to environmental perturbations that upset their natural hormonal processes and do two kinds of things. Give them three legs, take away a leg, and makes a male partly a female, makes a female partly a male. It's called hormonal disruption. Scientists have decided that these are the major reasons why frogs are amphibians in general are in decline in the United States. And, oh, I'm sorry, in the world. And about 90% of the reasons why they're dying off are habitat change and pesticide use. Quickly, here's an example of some experiments looking at the effect of Roundup at concentrations below what Roundup is found to be in our food, in our soybeans. Low concentrations of Roundup in 24 hours. These are the controls with no Roundup showing about 95 to 100 percent survival. But if there's 1.6 parts per million, very low amounts of Roundup put into the water, about 90, 75 to 90 percent die, not live, but die in 24 hours. See, the canary in the mine, very sensitive to perturbations. You may not be able to see this, but the bottom line here, these are uh, testicle tissues in frogs, ovarian tissue, and following exposure to Roundup, or so-called inert ingredient in Roundup, the males start producing female eggs, the females start producing male sperm. How about environmental perturbations? I'm getting close to the end. This is an aerial photo taken in the prairie pothole region of the upper Midwest. And it's just loaded with hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of little ponds and lakes. Heaven for amphibians, right? With the 2005 Farm Bill that encouraged farmers to switch to genetically engineered corn for, for uh, making ethanol, there was about 11 million acre expansion of farmland. And a lot of that was due to draining these ponds, taking the water out, backfilling them with soil, and planting them to GE corn. That's habitat disruption. Going from ponds to dry agricultural fields. Going from this to this. That is habitat destruction. Finally, 
crop yields, and I'll only subject you to this one slide, and then I'll get to the summary. Um, okay, let's walk through this. These are the years from 1860 to 2020. Our government has kept track of yields of corn. Amazing, isn't it? Here is the bushels per acre of yield. And in the 1800s, the yellow line here is virtually flat, going right across the field, or right across the slide. And it tells us no increase in corn yields for about 80 years. It stayed at approximately 27 bushels per acre. Then what happened? It's called technology. After World War II, there was a little bit, every year, a little bit of an incline in the yield, going from about 27 to about, oh, a little over 40. Primarily to things like, oh, uh, uh, irrigation systems, uh, some initial breakout on analyzing the genetics, crossbreeding, uh, discovering cobs that maybe had an extra row, discovering cobs that were a little longer, increasing the yields gradually. And this went on. And then we see here in the 1950s, wow, an even greater change in the yields year after year after year. On average, about two bushels per acre improvement every year, every year, every year, every year, due to technology. A lot of it hybrid corn, a lot of it is learning how to use fertilizers more efficiently, better harvesting equipment, more farmers having access to irrigation, and things got better and better and better. Until now, the average is about 160 bushels per acre. That's a lot. That's about four tons of corn kernels. My point in this whole slide, isn't somebody going to ask me why it's red and then it goes to green? You know what happened there? The red was prior to genetically engineered corn. The green is after genetically engineered corn. And there's no change in the rate of improvement with the genetically engineered corn. The improvement per year is still about two bushels per year. I have all kinds of other data from American scientists that are expressed in numbers. I, I won't bore you with that. But time and time again, the numbers comparing GMO, G, genetically engineered corn, with non-genetically engineered, in general, the results are no differences in the corn yields. No differences in the corn yields. The same kind of information is available for soybean. So going all the way back to the beginning, when I said this is how a genetically engineered plant is made. You take a Roundup resistant gene from a bacterium and you put it into soy or corn. Is that a yield increase gene? Is that going to change the nutritional content of the corn? No. no. Uh, what is it going to do? The only thing it does is that it relies upon some external actions to show itself to work. And that external action is your weed's got to be sensitive to Roundup. It doesn't say you're going to get more of your corn, you're just going to lose less of it if you don't use it. Or if you, I'm sorry, if you do use it because you get good control on your weeds, they're not competing for nutrients, not competing for moisture, your yields will be the same as John over here, Shh. grows non-genetically engineered corn because he doesn't have a weed problem. And so why he doesn't have a weed problem? Maybe he's one of those weird sustainable farmers <laughs> or organic farmers who doesn't have to spray, who doesn't have a weed problem. Folks, that's the bottom line. There's no difference. And it's whether it's you hear it from me, 
you hear from American scientists, for example, all of Purdue University, like Bob Nielsen, or you hear it from scientists in Australia, in Western Europe, they can't find differences in yields. So in wrapping this up, what have I tried to tell you? Food labeling rules are convenient, are confusing, sorry. They're inconsistent, and to me, they're not making sense right now. So if you want label, go to China. That's the message I want you to remember. You want label? Go to China. Go to Russia. Go to England. Go to Peru. Okay, you want label. The genetically engineered crop technology isn't for free. It's bumped up costs for everyone involved. Cost me what? More? Just because it's genetically engineered? Can you imagine the farmer saying, what? And I can't keep my seeds for next year's planting. Roundup resistant weeds are bringing in a severe problem. It may be bye bye Roundup, but what is what are we opening the door to? Bye bye monarchs. Another little phrase that I want you to carry with you when you leave here. Bye bye frogs. Bye bye bees. That's a, that's a different story. I can talk to you about that if you want in a minute. And failure to yield can result in an accident, right? If you're driving, I think there's a parallel here to the crop technology. Failure to yield can lead to an accident in using this technology. Please share what you've heard and learned. Uh, Isn't well, the labeling of food one of the biggest spikes that's going on right now because they're not wanting to people to know what's in food, so they're fighting it? And again, I'm yes. What and you because just said some is countries exactly right. do are yes. forbidding GMO uh, mm -hmm. products into their countries. China's one of them. Yeah. China's um, in my way of thinking, if we had food labeled, there are going to be, maybe there's no one in this room, but there are people in our society who won't care, right? They're not going to change their shopping habits, and they're just going to go shop. Not a problem. That's their problem, not mine. There'll be some of us in society that say, oh, my government is labeling my food somehow feel a little bit better about that. It must be okay. I'll buy it. Then there are others, probably like us in this room, that'll sort through it. No, don't want it. Yeah, that's a good one. No, no, I don't want that because it's GMO. I don't see it crashing this industry. I just see it changing our society and giving us Americans a choice. We don't have a choice unless you want to go to places. Food co-ops, delicious, beautiful. They're organic, they're not genetically engineered. But many Americans don't have access to such places. Many Americans don't even understand that going to a food co-op assures them genetically free, genetically engineered free foods. Think about that. These 64 countries you mentioned who label their foods, are, is their labeling consistent and confusing as, as just like ours? And part two, are they telling us um, what they're doing in terms of uh, herbis, herbicides? On what these was labels. the last question? The second question? On these labels, does that include information on uh, how that crop was controlled uh, with spray? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, that's right. on, the, on, the, on the second <laughs> one, whether their labels are confusing, uh, as as I, I don't think so, because it's very simple. It either contains or it doesn't contain. I was wondering if you knew about the half-life for the chemicals like Roundup. So like when you stop spraying, let's say, mm -hmm. how long does it take for the degradation so that the soil can... Um, you're going to find numbers that are quite variable from uh, a magnitude of less than a week to uh, three to six months. <laughs> 
and it isn't that one party is right and the other party is wrong. It's going to depend uh, heavily on meteorological conditions, the amount of rainfall, the time of the year, temperature, and so on. Uh, I can also tell you it also depends. Most crops, when they're exposed to glyphosate, <clears throat> very quickly uh, me metabolize it one step to another compound, abbreviated uh, AMPA, I think it is, uh, amino phosphonic acid, which is not glyphosate anymore. And that, in turn, makes it active, or suitable for microbial degradation. So in some places, you hear about, geez, glyphosate got into the water supply, very likely due to overfly, not due to long-term, as my farmers feel, and the, the winter rains came and it came off. It should be pretty much gone if it's applied, say, in an early crop in the spring and by before the, the winter rains come. Also, that reminds me to share with you, there now are reports that Roundup literally is in rain, comes down, as, especially in the cotton belt of the United States because of all the airplane activity that's using the glyphosate. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a, a critter looking for food, like a butterfly, or if you're a frog that's hypersensitive to what can be absorbed through its skin, you're in trouble comes down in the rain. There's no place to hide. Talk about cross-pollination a little bit, will you? Okay, that's the other uh, way, non-natural way, in which some plants can become resistant to uh, Roundup. And let me tell you what's happened in two places, two occasions in the state of Oregon. Uh, in the very early 2000s, there were field tests for uh, Roundup resistant grass. Field tests were done in Deschutes County, uh, and the grass, of course, by design, was the test was approved and the grass was allowed to go pollinate and go to seed. If any of you have visited the Willamette Valley at a certain time in the spring, you see yellow clouds moving around, that's grass pollen. You can see it with the with your eye, and the same thing happened in uh, Deschutes County just prior to a major weather event, uh, a pretty hefty uh, windstorm. And my colleagues that I left behind at EPA when I retired got to go out and discover for the first time ever to report that that pollen moved for about 13 miles off of the test plot and cross was successful in cross-pollinating wild, feral grass species growing, you know, out in Central Oregon. And they're still there today. The other event was very analogous to this, but it happened in now your county, which is close to the Idaho border. The field test was in Idaho, and there was an actual interstate transportation of genetically engineered pollen across the Snake River, cross-fertilizing wild feral grass in, in uh, Malheur County. Um, so, going back to the late 80s, in the early 90s, I find it remarkable with hindsight that scientists did not know how far pollen could travel, particularly from our crop plants. I remember in school, our instructor, genetics instructor, telling us, because we were into, my wife and I were into this, growing corn and growing popcorn. Oh, you've got to plant those in separate rows. Separate rows, like three, four feet apart. Now it's been documented for corn pollen, if I remember, about a half a mile. Sugar beets, about two to four miles. Of course, depending on the strength of the wind, and the wind has to come when it's ready to pollinate, you know, biology here. Uh, grass pollen, very small particles, 13 miles, and so on. So all of that was learned during the biotechnology era, EMRA, E-R-A, era too, <laughs> the hard way. Uh, so if any of you in here grow, uh, and I don't know where Chris is, but he should really be talking about this. Yes, I think he's about ready to come on. Yeah, let's bring in Chris. All right, here he is. Then there's also the problem of what it does to us when we eat it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I need to be careful how I answer that question 
because it's a very controversial topic that you bring up. And no, I would say 99.999% of the scientists in the world will tell you the same, uh, will give you the same answer, that we really don't know because as scientists we have to do controlled experiments mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have access to the biological materials because it's patented and it won't be released and we have to inform the companies before we ever make any presentations or you know, publish the results. It's just kind of a constipated situation where <laughs> proper control experiments cannot be done. Experiments that were done uh, uh, with pigs in the Midwest, uh, experiments that were done with the rats uh, in, in France were very controversial in the results because they surprised a lot of people and we're still waiting for some additional control experiments to be done to confirm uh, rather dramatic findings. You cannot ever believe and take for granted a dramatic result from a single laboratory when there's so much at stake health-wise money-wise, industry-wise, food-wise, and so on. And those experiments were all still waiting. <coughs> Chris, mm -hmm. the question has come up if, for you, actually, yes, to talk about the general issue of cross-pollination. General issue cross-pollination. So, <laughs> yeah, relative to the Rogue Valley here, we have sugar beets, and corn that are being grown. And so the implications of that uh, are that anything that are in the corn family, uh, the Poaceae family is a corn family, as Ray was just suggesting, 13 miles. Pollen's very small. It's probably further than that, but like they say, 10 miles pretty readily could get carried on the wind, but it's, you know, many, many miles. They've, they've found uh, uh, genetically engineered sugar beet pollen at 40,000 feet in a jet engine up, up, you know, in the sky, like they swapped it after it like got landed on the ground. So is the pollen viable? That's another question. You know, there's a lot of things to consider uh, about the temperature and the humidity and, uh, you know, whether or not the pollen would even be viable after, you know, X number of uh, amount of time, days, hours, perhaps. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue for us with the corn and with anything in the beet family, which is anything that are beets, table beets, uh, chard, um, and even, believe it or not, there are people growing certified organic sugar beets in the Rogue Valley. So any of those would be in harm's way uh, with, with uh, any of our farmers that are saving the seeds on those. And with the sugar beets, um, um, we don't know where, where uh, the company, the, the main company who's growing them, it should virtually say, just as of not too many months ago, was exclusively the only company, the only person, the only farmer in the Rogue Valley uh, having anything to do with sugar beets here. That kind of is probably the number one reason any of us tonight are seated here in this room. Uh, uh, the, the, the multinational from Switzerland who's banned to produce them in their own country. So um, this right here is a map of those plots of sugar beets that we know confirmed because we've seen them with our own eyes. That's the only way that we know that they are where they are on this map is because we have received calls or have directly personally gone to these locations and seen them sitting right there, little eighth of an acre, quarter acre, one acre, four acre plots um, that are out all across. Uh, this simply, here is simply the Bear Creek uh, area, you know, there's there's areas all across Jackson County. Uh, Josephine County is like right here on the edge, and you can see that um, up through here. I, you know, I, I mean, I can tell you right now, there's probably double the number of sugar beet plots we have confirmed. Um, just to, we're we're kind of redoing this map actually, um, and in Grants Pass, Josephine County, it, it continues. All these green dots here, by the way, are all our farmers who are. Uh, growing in this area. So you can see that the majority of the certified organic or the non-GMO people, you know, people who may be using chemicals, but they're not into the genetically engineered crops, that's, that's, that's these green dots here. And so we're, we're kind of, you know, coexistence is pretty difficult when you, when you think about this being the, 
the ridge, the top of the ridge right here, and this being the top of the ridge, this forms the Bear Creek watershed, this big dark band right here. Um, and you can see uh, Dead Indian Memorial Road and the Green Springs down here, California right here, uh, Medford is right here, um, and Grants Pass is, is right up yonder here. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, with the regulated status that we knew the sugar beets to be under when they were regulated, uh, deregulated fully as of July of 2012, um, uh, that that doesn't really fly for the Rogue Valley if you understand that, that at most from peak to peak, maybe three miles. But who, who the heck's growing up in class three and class four soils on the side of the mountain? You know, all these, all these right here are right down through the, you know, up the little gullies. Uh, and, you know, there's not a whole lot you know, the winds blow up the valley, down the valley. You know, the, you get the bottleneck effect, so the, there's, a, you know, sometimes some high winds. All it takes is one little event, and you, you got the GM pollen in your, in your crops, and you don't even know it, and you're saving your seed. And you're a certified organic farmer, or whatever it is that, that or, or you're not, not nothing to do with organic, but you just, you don't like GMOs. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You just, you, you don't even know. Like, where's the pollen? You know, this stuff's microscopic. It just, like, ends up in your, in your genetics of your crop. Can you talk about the synthesized um, coffee? and financial implications of the cross-pollination? Okay. Yep. I can go to... Did you have one question? Said it it sounded like there were more than you knew, or you found out that there were more plants. So, in our meetings with the Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association, which was a neutral party moderated uh, uh, number of sequence of whole meetings that we had over a number of months, it was held at Oregon State University Extension, Hanley, right down here on Hanley Road. And uh, we basically contacted the Farm Bureau, Josephine County, Jackson County, all the farmers across the region, Extension, put it out to hundreds of farmers to show up and um, have their, uh, you know, put their pin on the map. That was the whole point of the whole neutral, uh, you know, ap apolitical. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Extension was right there, you know, just they were watching like, okay, you guys can't talk about GMOs in this meeting because... We're not, no, we're not, you know, allowing you to use our facility here to talk about politics. You know, this was brought up constantly in all of our faces. We're like, right, right, okay. So let's just talk about putting pins on the map. And Syngenta's sitting there the whole time. And, uh, and they basically, after six months, sent some attorney down from Portland. And uh, they, they uh, that person was there to basically say, this doesn't work for Syngenta's business model. And so we're going to actually have to, to, you know, step out. And if you guys like want to go back to the table and talk about this again, uh, uh, where it's more beneficial and useful for the business model that Syngenta has, we would be open to that. But they grabbed their briefcases and marched out of the room, a process that brought dozens of farmers, nearly 50 farmers across the Rogue Valley together, Josephine Jackson County. So in a nutshell, that is the coexistence process. Uh, looking at you know who's where, what crops do you got? Are those going to contaminate? All that uh, coexistence has failed in the Rogue Valley, according to that. Chris, can I just quickly clarify what are the red dots? Uh, the red dots are the are the the GM sugar beet plots. Okay. So we don't know you know where's the corn? Who's growing corn? Who's growing GM alfalfa, which has also been grown in their area? So we understand there are a few farmers with Roundup Ready alfalfa. Uh, it, uh, after a little bit of investigation with the outlets that we could actually, uh, you, any of us could go purchase, sign a contract with, you know, with Monsanto or DuPont or whatever, we could purchase these seeds. There's uh, apparently uh, the Grange, uh, Big R, who else did we call, Helena Chemical. They don't really sell a whole lot of GMO seeds in the Rogue Valley. And this, of course, is uh, just in the past couple of years, the Roundup Ready alfalfa was deregulated early 2012 regulation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's been, so, so in reality, in practice, we've only had not much more than one year, because after it was deregulated, it didn't really make it to Southern Oregon. It was kind of over in Bend and maybe Eastern, uh, Eastern Oregon and up in <coughs> Washington. But um, according to the USDA APHIS, they told us that the GM alfalfa was going to be planted. I believe that was uh, that was uh, that was just over a year ago. So this last fall, is that right? 
where are we at? We're so anyhow, it's it's been about a year that if if anybody has planted, it was it was right. Yes, it was in the fall. You plant your alfalfa in the fall, so it was fall 2012. And and so did anybody plant in 2013? It's possible, but it's it's very likely. Uh, conversations I've had with dozens of farmers across the area that there's not a lot of people growing this stuff. So as far as the economic impact, Julie, really, it's it's likely that uh, uh, we're we're not talking about running. Uh, you know, our farmers into the ground or, or taking away like a huge economic, uh, you know, what, what, what all this work that they've already put into it, it doesn't seem like we're, we're going to create that much of, of a problem. But who knows what the farm bureau and these guys got up their sleeve. They're probably going to like, oh yeah, they'll throw the curtain open and there's, like, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Syngenta right now is looking for growers for their sugar beets. So it's like strategically, it's it kind of makes sense for them to well, who's who's on their team? So that these are these are discussions that are being had in the farming community right now, and about the economic impact uh, that that you know by but but why not look at it in respect to the twenty million dollar development? Uh, Amy's is looking to to expand their operation, and they have chosen the Rogue Valley because of its uh, you know what it is, what many of us understand the Rogue Valley to be. And so we, we, instead of complaining about how they're trying to tell all these farmers like what they should or shouldn't do with their farming operations, let's like come together as a community. Perhaps uh, uh, that that would benefit the bigger, bigger whole instead of like, you know, quabbling over somebody's taking away my rights. Okay. First, I just wanted to say maybe you could go a little bit into to the importance of the seed crops here because that's. I believe why they've targeted this region because we grow such a huge portion of the world's GMO free seeds. That's huge. That's yeah, me. so so the just looking at the so we live in a world class seed growing region. Many of the herbs and vegetables, uh, the seeds that, that we plant in our garden, uh, like by far the majority of those seeds come from the Pacific Northwest. So those are your brassicas. Uh, your beet and chard family, uh, spinach, onions, uh, leeks, um, and a whole slew of other crops come from the southern Oregon. A lot of the beta and uh, the beta, which are the beet and chard family, are grown in the Willamette Valley and in the Rogue Valley. And uh, we we know that just for instance, I think Katie uh, and I have had this conversation about how many of uh, that eighty percent of the U.S. sugar. Uh, Sugar beet, whether it's you know organic or uh, charred or beets, comes from uh, Oregon and.